Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Good Soul Church. I'm Dave. I'm the pastor here. It's so fun to have everybody in the room today. And I am so excited for today. Today, our church is officially one extra person because we had a baby. Not me. Um, we're missing three people today because two are the parents. And then Hamilton Hayes Holt, also known as Triple H, is... Um, is missing today, so uh, they're they're uh, they're texting me, excited about bringing him next week, and um, he's two days old. He was five days late, and uh, a beautiful little boy. And we're so just excited to see just a church with generations. I mean, it's so funny. This is, I think, our second baby born, second or third, second baby born while we've been having church, and um, it's been a lot of fun to see God just grow the church naturally. You know, organically and the way we should do it. Um, so, uh, I don't know if uh, you've been here a while. If you uh, if you uh, popped in, I know we have some people who haven't been in a while, and uh, I just want to let you know that um, Jesus is glad you're here, because I think you have uh, something to hear from Him today. Uh, I'm excited about the message. We just finished a series seven weeks long on the parables. So Jesus just telling stories in the Bible, and it was so much fun to go through that. I hope you loved it. You can go back and watch that. And uh, we pulled out some amazing truths from those parables. We uh, figured out how we should live. We uh, figured out how we should care for others. And ultimately, um, how God has a plan for the world. <clears throat> he really does. And, and my uh, friend, Pastor Chad Lang, came last week. And it was such a blessing to have him speak with you guys. And he did this final parable of the lost coin. And I just believe it was like a timely word for our church. It, uh, he's a powerful communicator. He told some great, great stories. But I love that he still pulls just all of the truth from the Bible about who we are and who God says we are. And uh, he showed us that we were all once lost. We we're all lost people. But then once we're found, we're actually supposed to go out and help find lost people. And it was just an incredible word from him to see how one of his friends invited him early to church and then they couldn't go. And then years later, he came to know the Lord. He was just like, man, I wish they had brought me earlier. I wish someone had found me earlier. And it was a cool message to hear. And, uh, and I think out of this place of being saved, out of this place of being found, we are a light to the world. And we need to go out and find others. And um, I love that this church is a place you can bring people. They can feel loved and appreciated and, uh, and welcomed. And they can meet Jesus in this place. And uh, it was a powerful message. I love that I was able to sit in the message. I, I sat in the front row. I took notes. And um, a lot of you were wondering why I wasn't preaching. Maybe I, I didn't explain that perfectly, but, uh, but um, I learned early on, before we planted the church, that some healthy disciplines and some healthy rhythms were important for me to stay healthy, for our family to stay healthy. And I've seen too many pastors burn out, make poor decisions, uh, ultimately become unhealthy simply because they did not take what God said about rest and balance seriously. And... Uh, Having a pastor, a friend of mine, be able to preach allowed me the freedom to actually go to Guatemala, which is going to be fun. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But uh, on this short little mission trip, without having this weight of having to write a message for Sunday, I really wanted to be fully present with my missionary friends, be fully present in what we were doing, and just be available if anything, like I needed to go above and beyond down there, because I couldn't just be sitting up in the top of some room in Guatemala writing a message for a Sunday. So it was a blessing to have Pastor Chad speak, and it was a blessing to our church, he's a wonderful communicator, and um, I'm going to tell you a lot more about that mission trip in a couple minutes, because I think a lot of you have been asking questions, I've been holding back a little bit from it, because I wanted to present it today. But first, um, I want to let you know that during the entire trip, I intentionally got back on a Friday night, Monday through Friday, because I wanted to be in church. I couldn't wait to be back in church, because if I'm honest, we started the church, because we absolutely love the local church. Like, this church was started out of a love for God's people, and His Word, and for the local church. It's not a burden on our family to start this church and to do this church. And we love to come together and worship with you guys and spend this amazing day together and fellowship and worship. And it's a blessing to us, and it blesses our lives. Sunday is really my favorite day of the week. And it's not, I'm just not saying that just to, you know, make sure you guys don't feel offended that you're, you're you know, in our homes and all that, like, no, really, it's our favorite day, and it's because of um, the way I look at the church and how David looked at the church, and in Psalm 122.1, it says this, 
David saying this, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You see, being in the house of the Lord should refresh you. And when I see people who don't come to church, they've come and then something else, some other priority has taken the place of that. I always wonder, like, what is it that's missing? Because when I come to church, I feel refreshed. You know, sometimes there's less people here than other times. It's spring break week, so we're missing a couple families that are on these trips. And wonderful. But church for me is a refreshing time. It's a time where I get filled up and I get to go out to my week and, and feel empowered to do what God has called me to do. And I know that coming back and making sure church was a priority was healthy for me. So going away was healthy, but getting back in the house of the Lord was healthy. And I think making Sunday a priority for your family sets a healthy rhythm for your life. It actually self sets you up to, to function out of a place of health versus a place of strain and, and getting pulled at both ends. So from the beginning, God, um, God has been a God of healthy rhythms. If you read the Bible, which we know is true, God actually created the whole universe and he had a rhythm to it. He did it in order, an order that was important, and then he rested. God doesn't need to rest. He was setting a rhythm for us, a healthy um, design for us. And um, when we come outside of those rhythms, when we get out of rhythm with God, um, things get out of sync and they get unhealthy really quickly. I've seen this happen in too many friends, whether in the business world or the pastor world. And when we started the church, we looked ahead and said, how can we as a family stay healthy? Because this, this, this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to put it together. It's a lot of work to come together. And so uh, we decided, and this is, I've never heard of a church doing this. If you have heard of one, I'm very proud of them. But we have decided, before the church even started, to take a couple weekends off as a church. You might say, well, how's, how's that work? Well, we already did it. We did it last year. In our first year as a church, we took two weekends off in May. And we said, go. Go on a family trip. Maybe go to another church and worship, worship at home with your family, but just schedule in a time of rest because there's a lot of families in this church who put a lot of effort into this church. And I said, well, how do I go away as a pastor, maybe take two weeks off and then ask every single other person to keep serving and keep grinding and keep doing it and, and fill the space with the pastor? I'd rather have a pastor come and me be blessed with an amazing message, be able to write some notes and get refreshed. And then us as a church take some time away. So last year we did that for two weeks in May. We're going to do it again this year. I just want to give you the dates to make sure you knew that we are going to take a church break in May. May 7th and 14th. I'm sorry. This is totally wrong. I don't know why I put it there. It's May 14th and 21st. I'm switching to another screen. No, um, no, yeah, so I don't know how. I, yeah, so we're meeting on May 7th. So this is the beginning of the break is going out <laughs> together on May 7th. And then the 14th is actually Mother's Day. So take your mom to breakfast. Make breakfast for your mother. Or take your mom and drop her off at a spa somewhere. Do that. May 14th and then the 21st um, we're going to have off. And then we're going to come back and we're going to be refreshed. And we're going to be excited about what God's going to continue to do throughout the year. And um, we did this last year and it was such a refreshing time. My family and I left for like 17 days. We went on a road trip for 17 days. It was it was amazing. And um, today we're going to start a new series um, called The Life of Jesus. And, uh, and I think it's really important that, uh, that Jesus, being the center of our faith, we learn about Jesus, what Jesus did. And these parables that Jesus told were because Jesus was a storyteller. Jesus paused to tell stories to teach biblical truths. But a lot of times we hear the words of Jesus and we don't necessarily look at the actions of Jesus, like, and learn from those. And so, um, the, this, uh, before we take this break coming, there's this actually really important holiday, you may not know about it, it's called Easter. It's fast approaching three weeks from now. And uh, Easter is this amazing holiday, we actually, in our family, refer to it as Resurrection Day, uh, because that's what we're celebrating. Easter has been kind of hijacked by secular culture, and it has to do with a lot of other things except for Jesus. But in this church... We are actually going to come back to center and focus on the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun that day. And You can wear your pastels. It's an amazing thing. But leading up into those three weeks of Easter, I felt like God was telling me we need to focus on Jesus' life. And actually, we're going to focus on three different aspects of Jesus' life over the next three weeks. And we're going to focus on Jesus the servant, Jesus the preacher, and then Jesus the Savior. 
So today, we're focusing on Jesus, the servant. Because Jesus was all three of these things. Jesus was many, many things. I had to figure out in three weeks what to call it. So, yeah, the servant, the preacher, the savior. But, but it's going to be amazing to see this first side. Because I think a lot of people think Jesus, yes, died on the cross, was resurrected. You know, he's reigning in glory. But what did Jesus do while he was here? And it's really important for us as followers of Jesus to see that. Uh, I'm going to start in this scripture in Luke uh, 4. And it's truly the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus gets baptized by his cousin John in the river, and then the Spirit calls him to the wilderness, where he's tempted by the devil. He fasts for 40 days, and he comes out of the wilderness, filled up with the Holy Spirit, ready for ministry. That's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so we're going to read this out of Luke 4, and I want you to see what he does right when he comes out of the wilderness. Are you ready? Here we go. So Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, his hometown. On the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So someone else decided, this is the scripture for the day, Isaiah. Verses 14 through 17. Now, verses 17 through 19 says this. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. He's reading Isaiah's words about himself and sits back down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So get this. Jesus, a small town kid with a really cool birth story, right? Like everyone has their birth story. <laughs> Jesus was the coolest birth story. Who from everything we know has done very little in 30 years. He has not been preaching. He's not been out. Goes to the wilderness and comes back and he is preaching. He's walking into synagogues. I'm a rabbi. I'm preaching. And all of a sudden, he enters the temple and he claims to be the promised Messiah. That's what he's doing in the scripture. This is me. That promise that's coming, this is me. And this is blasphemy to the nth degree. I mean, you could not be more blasphemous than this. And it's not well received. Because we see in the next couple verses, some of his hometown friends, his childhood friends, and the leaders of the synagogue take him up to a cliff to throw him off. I don't know if you guys knew that. Jesus, on his first day of ministry, was about murder. And he looks at these people, he's like, not today. And he walks right through the crowd. Now imagine that scene. Like he's getting manhandled up to the cliff, and he has enough power and authority to say no. And he walks through the crowd. We don't think about that enough, right? Like, that Jesus had something about him that people backed away. And they said, well, there's something there. And I just love it. It's a dramatic start to a three-year ministry that's just intense. The whole thing's intense. If you've never read the Gospels, read the Gospels. They're incredible. Like, it's just, you know, fire, fire, fire. Just like, Jesus is moving in mighty ways. But I want you to say, like, note what scripture he focuses on when he starts his ministry. He didn't say, I'm coming with a fist. He's not, I'm, he, I'm not coming as this conquering king. I'm not coming as this warrior. He chose a scripture that speaks of the poor, the prisoners, and the blind to start his ministry. And he's claiming that one of his roles as Messiah is to care for these people while he's here on earth and provide for them what they so desperately need. See, he's about to step into his role as the ultimate servant. And it's about to turn the world on its head. He's not going to do what they all expected. What the Jews expected was this conquering king, this warrior king, who's going to overthrow Rome. No. He's going to do so much more. So this rebel rabbi, who's claimed to be the Messiah, now leaves his hometown. He's not welcome there anymore. He really never does a miracle in his hometown, his entire ministry, because he was rejected. And he heads to this fishing town called Capernaum. And he begins teaching this new way of life. So just so you're aware, rabbis actually traveled around a lot. Unless you were in charge of a synagogue, you actually traveled. 
you were a teacher, and you gained a following. And so, unlike today where there's a university, if you wanted to train in, in um, you know, ministry, you'd find a rabbi, you'd ask to follow him, and, and you'd get a, a degree in Jesus, or a degree in Pastor Dave, or a degree in whoever. You'd follow them for a season, you'd learn from them, from their teachings, and, and from how they were living their life. And so Jesus had the same thing. People were following him as his disciples. But Jesus did it a little differently. A lot of these rabbis just waited for people to come along. Jesus invited people in to follow him. And we're going to see this here in a second. Jesus called men to himself, and he drew them into a bigger story because he knew it was important for them to watch him live life, watch him serve, and watch what was going to happen do, during his ministry. And uh, it's not necessarily how Jesus invited them, but their responses that I wanted to um, respond to today. So we see this first in Luke 5, and you guys probably know this story. Luke 5, 1 through 3, it says this. One day, Jesus was standing at the lake of Gennesaret, and the people were crowding around him listening to the word of God. So he's, all here, he's drawing crowds. He, said at the water, he, sat, he saw at the waters as two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. And he just got into one of those boats. He's just like, I'm just going to get in one of these. One belonging to Simon, who's Simon Peter. We know that, that, that character. And asked him, to put out a little bit from shore. And they do this, rabbis did this, so that they could speak over water, which carries your set, the sound better. So everyone up on the hill could hear them. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So Jesus is in this fishing town, and he asks to use Simon's boat. Simon, wanting to honor this visiting rabbi, allowed him to use the boat. And he said this in uh, 4 through 5. says this, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Hey, put out the deep water, and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon's like, you know he's just rolling his eyes going, okay, preacher, you know, like, I'm the fisherman here, right? And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. So Jesus didn't know anything about fishing, according to Simon. But Simon honored and obeyed because of who Jesus was and the authority Jesus had as a rabbi. And Jesus is about to show them a better way, a different way to do things. And it's going to change their perspective on everything. And so here, here's what happens. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled for their partners to come into the boat and help them. And, and they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. So these boats are out here just sinking and Jesus is probably just smirking. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and then this miracle impacted these men so greatly. And it was so tangible, so close to home, Jesus did something that affected them in their profession, in their real life, in the thing they were struggling with. They had caught no fish. And Jesus is like, I can help you with that, and I can help you with more. It changed their perspective on how they saw God. And finally it says this, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch they had, of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. Now you will fish for people. So they pulled, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. They gave up everything to follow this man. These fishermen were moved by a miracle in their own lives, in the thing they were struggling with. And because of that, they dropped everything to follow Jesus. And it's a choice we all get to make. We actually see a similar story happen with Matthew. So Jesus is healing a, this guy with leprosy, and Matthew in his tax collector booth is watching it happen. And Jesus just walks by the tax collector booth, and we see this in Luke 5, 27, 28, says this, After this, Jesus went and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, which is Matthew, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said. And Levi got up left everything and followed him. Now, I mean, there was no hesitation in the scriptures. And I want you to consider for a second, Matthew had one of the most lucrative jobs in all of the Middle East. He was a tax collector. He swindled people. He charged too much. He was rich. He had everything he could ever want, but he wasn't filled up. But he was willing to give all of that up to follow this man because he'd seen something different. He saw something different, attractive, something this high-paying job could never compete with could never fill up. So the promise of God is that there's so much more when you begin to follow Him. There's so much more to this life, there's so much more to your career, there's so much more to your family, to your effect on this world when you begin to follow Him. And Jesus just kept recruiting and kept asking these men this simple question. 
follow me. Will you follow me? Come follow me. He just kept saying it, and these men just kept leaving everything and following him. And we see throughout the Gospels, women were coming, wealthy, poor, everyone is following Jesus throughout, throughout his ministry. Thousands and thousands of people. But it would cost them almost everything to follow. They had to give up a lot to follow Jesus. But at the same time, and we'll see later, that they would gain everything. And so over three years, Jesus spoke to thousands of people. But he poured his life into these 12 men, one of which betrayed him. So these 12 men, Jesus poured everything into. They saw how he lived, how he slept, how he prayed, everything. They did life together. And they were at his side in the Garden of Gethsemane, where, where he was betrayed by one of them. And, and some of them were with him. It was intimate. They saw his life. And these men experienced many ups and downs. And they began to learn, to listen, and experience miracles experienced life change that only Jesus could offer. And the thing that I think changed them the most was not after his death and resurrection. That changed them forever. But the thing that changed them during his ministry was watching Jesus as the servant. Because it was not what any other rabbi was doing. It was not what the Pharisees were doing. It was not what people would say to do. It was different. And we're going to see what Jesus did in a minute. You see, everyone expected the Messiah to be this warrior king. And Jesus showed up and began a ministry based on service, compassion, and living outside of yourself. Nothing for yourself, everything for others. Because the way Jesus stepped into the world was different than anything they had ever experienced. It changed so many hearts because they saw something new and saw something different. He showed them a brand new way to live life. And um, following Jesus' life and ministry became known as following the way. There was a new way. Before Christians were called Christians as a derogatory term, that's how they got called Christians, by the way, they said, we follow the way. That's all they would say, we follow the way. It's a new way to serve and live. And this is important. Jesus could have come as the conquering king. He could have wiped them all away and picked a couple. Hey, we're going to heaven. But instead, he chose to come as a servant. I wrote it this way. Jesus came to serve and not be served. And this is what this first week's about, is Jesus serving. Being the ultimate servant and showing us what it is to serve. You see, Jesus was royalty in heaven. And he stepped down to earth into the role of a servant. He didn't have to. Well, how do we know this? Because he told us. John 6.38 says this, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me, my Father. So God had a plan for this whole world. And Jesus was part of the plan, but he needed Jesus to come down and serve as part of that plan. So Jesus was serving his Father in heaven by coming to earth. He stepped down into time, down into our mess, which was a mess, we'll talk about it in a second, and became the greatest servant we've ever known. We see it in Mark 10, 45, it says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. This is Jesus speaking. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to show us an example of a life poured out for others. A life focused on serving and not striving for more. We live in Wellington, Florida. Everyone's striving for more. Jesus showed us a life of service. And ultimately, a life that would be given for us so that we could all be free. The ultimate service was giving his life for us. He came to show us a new way. That's why his followers called it the way. And uh, it was a better way. And a way that we need to embrace today. It was a massive culture shift. And it was not really easy to understand because it's this new concept. See, God calls us to serve those around us without wanting anything in return. And uh, if you think that's a new theme with Jesus, it's actually throughout the Bible. Just the Israelites and then Israelites within Roman occupation just decided to forget about over 2,000 verses that talk about serving the poor and the needy, uh, those who are enslaved and the prisoners and, and the immigrants and all the people, the widows and orphans. 2,000 verses to care for those who have less. And the Jewish people had forgotten it, and Jesus came to change that. We see some clear examples of how we're supposed to care for the poor. We see it back in Psalm 82. It says this, Defend the weak and fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. David's crying out to God, like, God, can you do this? And God's probably saying back to David, you do it. I put you there for you to do it. It's not a passive statement. 
Because in the culture Jesus was born into, the fatherless were forgotten, the weak were taken advantage of, the poor had no chance. The last in society had been discarded by society. And to fix the problem, it was probably messy. To fix the problem of this, this poverty, these widows, this orphans, was going to be messy. But God's telling his people throughout Scripture, get involved in the mess of the world, even if it's inconvenient. Because I, I, I wrote it this way. Serving that truly makes a difference will often get your hands dirty. A lot of us want to serve without getting our hands dirty. Have you ever avoided getting involved in something because it was messy? Yes. Oh, yes. Me too. Me too. All the time. All the time I'm avoiding something because it's inconvenient or it's messy or what is the perception of that? Like, there's those thoughts always through my head. I know they're through yours. Well, God is calling us to step into the mess. Whatever the mess is, step into the mess. Proverbs 31, 8, 9 says this. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. For the rights of all those who are destitute, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. He also calls us to speak up and not be silent when bad things are happening. In this culture today, are you willing to speak up in this culture today, in a cancel culture today? We need to be willing to defend the rights of those who are down and out, who have no hope, who can't speak for themselves. Have you ever seen an injustice taking place and not said something? I think we all check our hearts. We have. Um, I hope we don't do it often, but we all have. And God is telling us to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And we know that Jesus did not just talk the talk, but he did walk the walk. And he served those around him selflessly. As we walk through the Gospels, we see Jesus consistently stepping down out of his role of rabbi and uh, places that rabbis would not be caught dead, and he steps into those places, into the mess, and he changes everything. We don't see Jesus just heal the sick. We do. But we see him embrace the sick. Touch the leopard. Touch the blind man. Things that you could never do in this culture. People who had been, probably been untouched for years felt human touch in Jesus for the first time. Jesus fed those who were hungry, but he didn't just... Just give everyone just enough. Baskets were overflowing. Extra baskets were collected at the end of feeding 5,000. Because Jesus never just served. He overly served. I love this. I love this scripture. It's one of my favorites. Mark 10, 16. And he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on them and blessed them. Uh -huh. Jesus welcomed children and orphans to come to him and held them and showed them affection in a culture where fathers did not do this. They were discarded. They were second-class citizens until they could go to war. Second-class citizens until they could pay their taxes. Children had very little rights. And Jesus said, let the children come to me. And we see him take the lowest position in a household, which is the person who washes feet, and he gets down on his hands and knees and washes the, the nasty things off the disciples' feet. It was not culturally acceptable for anyone of the household to do this. This was usually slaves and servants, and Jesus did it. It was so crazy that Peter actually refused. He's like, you will not wash my feet. He's like, I will wash your feet. And they're like arguing. And he's like, you cannot come into my kingdom unless you wa let me wash your feet. He's like, okay, wash my feet, Jesus. But that role was the role of a servant, role of a slave. And so over his three-year ministry, Jesus, the king of the world, decided to lower himself into a position of a servant. And then he called all of us, all of his disciples, into that same role. He didn't just tell us to do it. He lived it. And Jesus was very serious about this. And in the book of Matthew, Jesus gives this powerful illustration about God's blessing if you do, and God's curse if you don't. And I'm going to read it to you, and I want you to just receive this and put yourself in this story. It's, it's a good amount of scripture. I'm just going to read through it. And I want you to see yourself in this story. It starts in Matthew 25, and it goes through uh, 40, 46. It says this, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will put the sheep on His right, and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous, on the right, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see a sick person in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He didn't pull any punches. He said, if you don't show compassion, live generous and selfless lives to those who need it, you are not coming into the kingdom. And then he jumps into the second half of it. He says, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, and prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, and needing clothes, or sick, or in person, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And I don't know about you, but that scares me. All the times I've walked by the homeless guy, all the times I've walked by a need, all the times I haven't spoken up for the ones who couldn't speak for themselves. And I want to say there's grace in this. We're all on a different path. We're all on a different place uh, in our, our faith journey. But I'm not going to hold back on the scripture and say that if we do not step in to the roles of servants in this life and do not make it a part of our life, um, God says we're not promised anything because you cannot love him and not love his people. And I wrote it this way. We should all desire to be sheep and not goats. Simple way to write it and say we need to be on the right, not the left. We need to step into the role of a servant. I want to hear from God one day that I served and I sacrificed and I gave everything I had to make a difference in people around me. I desire to hear from God one day, well done, good and faithful servant. So then, knowing that, knowing that scripture's right there, Jesus said those words, why don't we live the life of a servant? Like Jesus asked us to. He's very clear. Just give, serve, love. Why won't people follow Jesus' example? We see it throughout history. We see the rabbis not doing it. The people not doing it. We don't do it. Because it takes sacrificing some of our own desires, putting the needs of someone else in front of ourselves, and it takes embracing God's plan for the world, not our own. And I wrote it this way. Because following Jesus will cost you something. Any, any prosperity preacher who says you meet Jesus and you get a plane, that's not how the gospel works. Jesus promised that we would still walk through stuff. But Jesus also said you'll walk through stuff with grace and peace if you step into the role of a servant and put other people ahead of yourself. Whether it's time, money, convenience, a hobby that you love, to follow Jesus' example takes devotion to his ways to his church, to what, his, to what we're supposed to be doing as followers of God, and it will naturally require some sacrifice on our part. So if you are walking with God right now and don't feel like there's some sacrifice in it, then I would question whether you're truly following the words of Jesus. We actually see in the Bible a young Jewish man who claims to have kept the law perfectly, right? I've done all the things, Jesus. How do I inherit eternal life? That's what he's asking Jesus. Perfect question. We all want to know the answer to that question. And Jesus answers in a perfect way that points us back to this idea of serving. He exposes the heart of this man. I think it's going to expose us a little bit. It says this in Matthew 19, 21, 22. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, because he's saying, he's telling Jesus he is perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Remember? Peter, James, John, Matthew, hey, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. This guy is staring at the Son of God, the King of Kings, the ultimate servant, and, he, and all Jesus asks him to do 
is give up some of the things of this world and begin to be, make a difference in the lives of others around them. Jesus never said, you won't get it back. Jesus said, go move to Africa, live in a hut, and only speak to four people the rest of your life. He said, he said hey, all that worldly wealth that you're hoarding for yourself, give it away. And you'll be rewarded in eternal life with treasures in heaven. And the man couldn't do it. What he was doing, he, Jesus didn't need his money. Jesus has unlimited money. Jesus is in charge of all possessions, all time. He could create money like this. He didn't need his money. He didn't even need his influence. He needed his heart to change. He needed him to understand the true heart of God is a supernatural love for people, not for stuff. God will give you the stuff to reach people. And I'm a true believer in that. In this church, we don't ask for anything. But God has always provided, and we have overwhelming generosity in this church. Because people understand that we're going to serve the Lord with that money. And I think there are people who um, are all around who have needs who could have been met by this man who never got met. Those needs never got met. Jesus probably found another way to do it, but this man had the opportunity to bless. And there's needs all around us and hurts all around us that we could meet um, if our hearts change. So Jesus came to earth, poured his life out for us, and he's asking us to do the same for others. It's a simple ask, but it's a hard ask, right? It's, it's an ask that a lot of these people in the Bible failed at. His disciples saw a model, and after Jesus' resurrection, and this is what I was saying, they were changed, but they didn't know how they were changed until they got filled with the Holy Spirit's power. And they're like, oh, this power isn't going to make us more wealth. This power is going to change the lives of everyone around us. And with that power, they went out and they changed the lives of the lost and the broken and the hurting and the widows and the orphans. A lot of the people we hear about in the Bible like uh, changed everything for the world. Remember the first hospital we talked about a couple weeks ago was set up around 300 AD by monks who said, we need to care for the poor in a better way, the sick and the hurting. Let's open our monasteries up to the poor and the hurting. No one else opened up another hospital outside of the Christian faith for 700 more years. Think about that. They were serving. So, we need to remember the poor. We need to pray for the poor. And we, we do that. Every weekend we pray for that. We also need to do something. Actually do something. We need to put some uh, you know, feet to the, to the words we're speaking, right? And go somewhere. Do something. Serve. And God is so good because He actually wired us this way. If you feel unfulfilled, if you feel like there's something missing... Start serving somebody else and see how you just come alive. God wired us with this overwhelming need to be a part of something bigger than yourself, to serve outside of yourself. And anyone who's ever set up some sort of nonprofit or done have that humanity or gone a soup kitchen or whatever, you don't leave there going, man, I could have done something better with eight hours. Like, no, you leave there going, man, when can we do that again? Because God did that for you. He put that in you. And until you step into that, you'll never know what this life could be about. We were, um, we were designed to be filled with a purpose bigger than ourselves. And it's addictive because we all want to be a part of something that impacts eternity, impacts the kingdom, impacts people in a real way. And I wrote it this way. A life poured out for others will always make an eternal difference. If you can just make this shift of stopping, like building our own kingdoms and pouring our lives out for others, you're going to make a huge difference in eternity. <clears throat> So how do we live a life that actually matters? How do we do this? Well, I'm going to give you some steps. We have to live focused on the correct things, on the right things, the things that Jesus was focused on. See, Jesus lived a life focused on things that mattered for eternity. He didn't get caught up on the things that didn't. So he gave help to the hurting. He saw some hurt, and he helped it. You don't need me to help the hurting. You need you to help the hurting. Like, I can help direct some funds that way or a need to be met. We can do that as a church. But if you see a hurt, help it. Fix it. He gave hope to the hopeless. You have the Spirit of God in you, and you can lead someone to Christ. You can give them the hope that's in you. Your testimony is more powerful than anything I'll say up here on stage. Tell them how God changed your life. And that changes everything. So give hope to the hopeless. Jesus did. And then always point people to heaven. Don't point them to this church. Don't point them to the thing that you have going. Don't point them to some sort of outside ministry, building houses for the poor. No, point them to heaven. And then God will use them to change this world. He didn't do everything from an ivory tower from heaven. Jesus came to earth and served. 
and we are in this really nice suburb of South Florida, and sometimes we can build our own little ivory tower, our own little kingdom, and forget that there's needs in this community, right outside this community, and beyond. He stepped into the mess, came down to earth, and began to serve those who needed it most. He skipped over the religious. He said, you have your reward. I'm going to serve the poor. And this brings me back full circle to Guatemala. So, I went on this short mission trip. And I went with just a backpack. I went light. It was Spirit Airlines, so <laughs> I didn't want to pay. <laughs> I'm like, what can I get in this thing, right? So, and to be honest, I went down there with an open heart that God would give me a fresh vision for my life, for our church, uh, how to serve people in tangible ways, and, and also ways that would impact heaven for eternity. And, um, and I don't know what I was expecting when I landed there. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I had some ideas, but I quite wasn't sure. But God knew what I needed to experience. And I'm telling you, I came back full of renewed vision and excitement for what's ahead. And I'm really sad for people who aren't in the room, because I think you're going to experience the feeling of the trip by being here. And this is some pictures. But what I, um, what I felt there, I hope, comes across. And I think it's, it's changed me, and it's, cha it's going to change this church. And, uh, but I want to start with this picture, which my kids are going to think is really funny. <clears throat> so, in 2009, I actually went to Nicaragua on a completely medical trip. There was no evangelistic component to it. It was through med school. This man who loved Jesus had gone and served in Nicaragua for 30 years. He's a pediatrician. He set up these clinics. And, um, and I went down there, and everything changed for me. I don't think I'd ever seen such poverty. I don't think I'd ever been like, moved in such a way. This is one of my best friends, Irving, who's now a pediatric surgeon. And we're like racing these kids, and they're beating us, and it was sad. But um, this is the clinic, and, and honestly, um, it just changes you. When you experience something like this, it changes you. And we were there for a couple weeks. Actually, Danielle was able to fly down. We took the last couple of days and actually went to the other coast and surfed and just enjoyed the time. But we came back, and Danielle and I sat there talking, and we were married at the time. And we said, what are we doing with our life? There's people hurting. You're being trained in pediatrics. Let's go change the world in Nicaragua. And so our dream, you may not know this about me, um, as I was graduating my training in medicine, uh, I was recruiting partners, and we were going to start a clinic in Nicaragua. Central America, we, are, we like Nicaragua. Irving's from Nicaragua, so there's a headway of connection there. And um, we were going to have a clinic that was 24-7, like round the clock, and me and three partners, so four of us, would split the time. We'd move for three to six months with our whole families, live in the community, serve the poor, while a separate clinic in America was making the money and fully supporting the ministry. And we were, we were like writing out business plans, talking to friends. It was going to be evangelistic. It was going to like bring people to know the Lord. And uh, we were so excited. Um, we believed in going all in. This trip changed me. Um, I've been to Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, and um, it changed me. And so, um, we were desperate to pour our lives out for others. And I don't know if you guys know much about medical training, but, um, but we had to move. And we had to change locations. And I moved away some, from, from some friends. We were dreaming this way. And, and we had five kids arrive in our life. And, and we're moving, uprooting over and over and over again. And this dream faded. This dream went away. And um, the dream of the free medical clinic in Nicaragua never, never happened. And honestly, though, God's timing is better than my timing. And God's plan is always better than our plan. And I've never regretted not starting this clinic. Isn't that interesting? Like, I saw the picture, it's a little bit nostalgic, but I don't regret not starting it. Because God had a better plan in mind. I saw how God planted that seed early in my life to change my posture towards service to others, change my heart from just being a doctor uh, to serving. And um, after years of gained experience now, he's positioned me to make a far greater impact into some lives um, through the impact of the local church and ministry partners who are already there than we could ever have made on our own. So as I arrived in Guatemala, um, my heart was positioned to receive fresh vision. I knew this story. I'm like, God, what, what are you going to do now? Like, what, what are we going to do? And as a pastor now, pastor and doctor, 
of an incredible church who has incredible resources, I said, how can we come together to serve this community? I'm open, God. I'm wide open. And so um, I was blessed to go to a place called In Ministries. And this is a, a, a ministry founded by this man right here, uh, Mike, um, 37 years ago. He was a kid from Pennsylvania who said, I'm going to learn Spanish and move to Mexico. Gets kicked out of Mexico, moves to Guatemala. <laughs> moves to some small town in Guatemala named San Cristobal and starts In Ministries. And this is his son, Jed, who so some of you might know. This is their team. Uh, this, this meeting was done all in Spanish, which was amazing for me to kind of brush up on some stuff. They built this, they built this incredible ministry with, with a, a school for all the local kids to come to, an incredible soccer court um, that, uh, that is used every single day into the late nights. It's got big lights on it. This is Jed walking with a man we found in the streets that was in and out of church. They have a church service that meets every Sunday. They're serving and, and they're meeting this community. And they've been there forever. Jed, who is as Caucasian, Louisiana boy as it comes, speaks fluent Guatemala, like Spanish. There's a, there's a dialect to it. And, and he's having this meeting in Spanish, speaking to this guy's face, and making a difference. And it just, it changed me. Like, to see it happen and see a ministry that had been built over three decades changed me. Can you imagine going all into something and not seeing the fruit for decades? The things that happened to this family, I'm not going to go through all the stories, but incredible hardship, incredible sacrifice. But they're making an incredible difference. And I'm sitting there just, just soaking it all in, just enjoying every moment of it. And so one of the things about Guatemala you may not know is it's got the best coffee in the world. And in the 80s and 90s, there were civil wars that were happening, and a lot of women lost their husbands to civil wars. Widows everywhere, orphans everywhere. But they're on the greatest coffee plantations in the world. And so these big companies come in, you know, Jabalia and all these big companies you've heard of, and try to just take the land and take everything. So in ministries, knew this was a problem. And this local people called the Pokomchi people, which is a Mayan Indian people, there's over 100,000 of them still, they speak a Mayan language, it's not Spanish. Some of these families have gone there to learn the language, to translate the Bible for them, and to help them with this, the only industry they have, which is coffee. And they started in Capehu. And this is the, uh, the Pokemchi word for coffee. And this man speaks Spanish and um, Pokemchi. So he's ministering to all these widows. You see the little kids and the widows. And they are literally harvesting the coffee, drying the coffee, like shelling the coffee, roasting the coffee, doing everything for the coffee. And because of this company, this nonprofit company, they're allowing all the proceeds to stay with these women. There's 180 widows who are together in a co-op that these ministries help them legally and, and fight all the battles against the big companies so that everything stays at home. Before, they had nothing. And so this little girl showed me her house. Twelve of them live in it. And uh, on the floor, there's an open fire burning under a tin roof. And that's what they're living in. And, and they're producing the greatest coffee in the world, and they were making nothing off of it. And so now, the, this ministry has come alongside them and is selling their coffee for them directly to consumers. And all of the proceeds are going to there. The coffee you're drinking today is from them. I saw them drying it and roasting it. It was incredible. And uh, so you know, this is what they live in. It's just an incredible experience to see that this in ministries developed a new arm of ministry that is now serving widows and orphans directly where they are, with nothing for themselves, fully sacrificing for people. I got to pray over them in Spanish, oh, so in English, Jed translated it in Spanish to him, who then translated it in Pocomchi. I have a video of it, I didn't show it today, but it is the coolest prayer I've ever prayed. And they would just receive it, and at the end, they all said amen, and they all just received what I prayed over them, a blessing in it. And it was just an incredible moment. So these, the kids, you know, anytime you go to a third world country, they're just following you everywhere. You know, we look different. You're right, so they think it's super interesting. But it was an incredible moment for me. And it was so cute. I, I, it, she's incredible, yeah. And, and so um, I got to sit with them, hear their stories, pray over them, let them know that our church is going to come alongside them. We will not buy any other coffee except from this. I don't care what it costs us because it means so much to me at this point. Um, we're going to directly support them. However, that works out. And God has a vision for that. I had a vision for that two years ago. My vision's changing. And I, I can't wait to share that with you as that develops. 
What I know is that the coffee we now purchase is building healthy families, creating safe work environments, saving them from this overbearing government that's trying to take everything. Um, and it's making a huge impact on widows and orphans because we drink nice coffee here at church. And so I'll say this to say, in ministries moved there. And through their partnerships, and this cool South African guy moved there, and this is his component of it. He doesn't speak any Spanish. And he's just trying to, he's the business guy who gave up everything during COVID because he wasn't allowed to run his business anymore, and moved to Guatemala and said, I can, I can use those skills to help someone. And he's the one coordinating all this. Can't wait for you guys to meet him one day. But I will say, this trip was incredible. So Wednesday, we're just, we're pumped up. This is so excited. We're dreaming. I'm dreaming. And then everything changed, and it kind of rocked me, because late on Wednesday night, we're about to have this incredible meal, um, and we got a call that changed the entire trip. <clears throat> a young lady named Rocio, um, also known as Rose, um, she was a missionary kid who moved there 40 years, uh, her parents moved 40 years ago to translate the Bible into Pocum Chi, and they achieved that. And when they achieved it, they had the New Testament translated into its Mayan Indian language by themselves. These parents did it by themselves. They left, and Rose went to college, got married, and came back to Guatemala to serve her people, because she's a Guatemalan citizen. This is, these are her people. <clears throat> and um, we got a call that said she tragically passed away <clears throat> that Wednesday night, uh, just minutes down from where we were staying. <clears throat> no one expected it. It was totally out of the blue. It took the air out of the room. I'm looking at people who've known Rose for her whole life. She's 28. Like, they were there when she was born in Guatemala, this family I'm staying with. <clears throat> and you see this girl lived her whole life in Guatemala, and after her family moved back, she moved back because she loved people so much. Her ministry was actually helping women have home births because the, um, the C-section rate is like 98% in Guatemala. So you, if you want to have an natural birth, you have to do it at home. She's, her husband's like physiotherapist, and they're helping women do this. They were serving these Pocum Chi women so incredibly. And um, her family's focus was these young families. And all of a sudden, her life ends abruptly, without answers. And in a world that always wants an answer to this, we could ask God, why? Why? Why would you take her so soon? She's only 28. Why wouldn't you let her continue to work with these women? I mean, she was making a huge difference. And why would you leave this young family without a mom? And as I began to try to minister to my missionary friends, because honestly, I shifted from like excited, celebrating, dreaming about coffee, went to like, man, like, okay, as a pastor, as a father, as a, like, what, what can I do? And I'm just like, Frantically in a, lang in a language that I, I, I speak some Spanish, but like I'm lost at what's happening. There's cultural things that are happening, Mayan Indian things, that, all this stuff is happening. I'm just like trying to serve wherever I can. And um, <clears throat> I was surprised though, and this is where I'm getting at. Um, I never heard them ask why she died. I saw them feel the tragedy, I saw them overwhelmed with grief, but I never heard them curse God. I never heard them ask why, because they knew that um, <clears throat> there were things to be done. Rose is serving people. Her family needed help. Like, there are people who are going to grieve. And this family, this missionary family shifted from, woe is us, why God, to let's serve. How can we come alongside a grieving family, a grieving community, the best way we know how? And I just, it wrecked me to see them not just you know, like, uh, worry about how they're feeling about this situation, instead, move into serving mode. Even though they were heartbroken, um, they knew there was a broken community and a broken family that was going to ask those questions. They needed to be available for it. They were going to step into the brokenness except, and instead of stepping away. And they were going to step in no matter what it cost them, no matter how it broke them, no matter what, it was going to be messy, and they were going to step in. And I got to watch a group of selfless people come alongside a family and a community and serve in the most incredible way. And over the next 36 hours, we shuttled back and forth. We're five hours from Guatemala City. And we were preparing to, like, 
All of her siblings, her t- ten siblings are flying from Sweden, the Philippines. They're all missionaries everywhere. They're all trying to get back home to be there with the family. So we're shuttling from the airport. We're just going crazy. 36 hours of just frantically serving everything we could do to serve. To honor a life that made an eternal impact in her short 28 years. You see, Rose knew moving to Guatemala, there was risk. She could have stayed in Pennsylvania. She could have lived a cool life. Husband's a PT. You know, I'm just here serving the community. No, she chose with her family to move into a place that's very dangerous to live as an American, which they would consider her. And um, see, Rose knew that. But she also knew that it was her call to serve this community. She'd done it her whole life, and she wasn't going to stop And she knew that she could make an eternal impact and God would use her to make an eternal impact if she just poured it all out and gave it all for God. And I wrote it this way to honor her. A life poured out for others leads to a life of eternal impact. And in a life that was cut short, and we all believe it was, right? Rose made an eternal difference in countless lives. There is a people group who can read the Bible because her family chose to go. That is an eternal difference. And those that are left behind will continue to grieve her loss. There's such hard like times ahead for them. But heaven is celebrating a life, even though short, that made an eternal impact. And more than most of us would ever make in what she did in her 28 years. Her story will continue to be told. We'll continue to remember her. But it's going to continue to make an impact in this community because of the loss. God is going to use that to change hearts and change lives, maybe hearts that were hardened before the loss. Because she chose to live beyond herself and love others right where they were at. In ministries, who her family was kind of a part of that, they'll continue to minister to, through their schools and their church services and local village outreach. And, and I know God's going to use them to change generations in Guatemala. And through hosting mission trips, which which I'm excited that we're going to go on one and allowing people to serve in these communities. They're inspiring people, not to stay there and do that, maybe, but to live outside of themselves for something greater. And in my short time in Guatemala, I witnessed the sacrifice of so many, including the ultimate sacrifice to be there serving people and lives that were being poured out for others. And I saw the gospel being preached in words and actions. I think in America, we preach a lot of words. And our actions don't always line up with their words. So I came back from this whirlwind trip, and I was moved to do something. Like, I'm like, okay, you gave me all this inspiration for four to three days, and then you gave me all this tragedy for two days. How am I processing this? And I tell you, I just was reinvigorated with passion for serving beyond my capacity to do so. God, use me. Use these hands. Use our family. Use this church however you want to use it for your glory. And I was hoping that he would reveal to us how we could step into the mess, wherever it is, and begin to live lives that follow Jesus' life of serving. So I'm asking, so, like, should you go to Guatemala and become a missionary and live there forever? No, I'm not asking you that. We should pray about it. Am I asking you to consider going on a short-term mission trip in the fall to Guatemala and experiencing this? Yes, I am asking you. Um, We're going to have a a meeting about that in a couple weeks, but we're going to go in late July on a mission trip to this place. You'll be able to hear the stories, and it will change you. And so I'm asking you to prayerfully consider that. Go and be the hands and feet of Jesus. I know you'll come back changed. But mostly, what I'm asking you today is to consider how, how you live every day here in Wellington, Florida, in Palm Beach County, in a very affluent part of the world. Are you living a life of self-preservation, of growing your own kingdom, and taking care of yourself? Or are you living a life of a servant who thinks of others first and maybe sacrifices some of the things of this world so that others can know the hope that's in us? Because on my final day, here in Guatemala, Jed and I hiked up to the top of a mountain just to pray, worship a little bit, and um, this mountain... Cool picture. What you don't understand is 30 years before, this was the holy, wicked mountaintop. The darkest place in this town was the here. And 30 years later, God showed me that a couple families 
moved to Guatemala 30 years before to a place of darkness and evil and satanic worship and wicked behaviors. In the middle of nowhere where darkness reigned, people showed up with the light of Jesus and eternities have been changed. And the community is now being drawn closer to God. And God showed me this, that our greatest impact will be made when we begin to live as Jesus lived. These families took, owned it. They knew that there was something bigger than their kingdom to be built. And they moved there. And this cross is beautiful. And it's an incredible view of everything in the town. And, and you just like, you could pray over it, worship over it. But the, the battles that happened on this mountain, in the spiritual, those families are ready for it. We should all desire to live lives modeled after our Savior. And his disciples... Um, watched as the king of the universe came from heaven down to earth and got on his hands and knees and washed the feet of people they didn't think deserved it. And it changed everything. And Jesus is calling us into that same life. Um, a life of sacrifice and a life of service. A life that puts others ahead of ourselves. It's so hard to do today in this 21st century culture. A life that leverages our overwhelming blessings, which we do have, and using those blessings to change the world. So as I close and pray, I want you to take a moment to take inventory of your life. Are you modeling your life after the life of Jesus? Are you seeing people as Jesus saw people? And is your life making an eternal difference in those around you? You see, God is not calling everyone to go to places like Guatemala and live in the woods and be with people who don't know Jesus. He's calling some. Is that you? I don't know. You've got to pray about it. But he is calling all of us to start making a difference in the life that we're living right now today and make a difference in those around us right now that we're tangibly can touch and feel and serve and love. So maybe for you, he's asking you to go. Others, he's asking you to give to what we're doing. Maybe sponsor someone to go on the mission trip who couldn't afford the mission trip if you have the ability to do that. But one thing I know for a fact is that he's asking all of us to begin to live lives that are focused on others and not ourselves. That are poured out for others and not ourselves. And lives that make an eternal difference in the lives around us. We all have that ability. So let's as a church begin to serve as Jesus served. And allow him to use us to change the world around us. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for this convicting message, Lord God, that, that puts you ahead of all things. That uses your life, Jesus, as an example for how we should live, Lord God. Lord, I just repent of any times that we have, as a church, as people, put uh, our own priorities ahead of your um, vision for this world and your hope for this world, Lord God. And we just come back to you and ask a, for forgiveness in that. And we just pray that you give us a new mind. A uh, new vision for how we as a church, as good soul churches, as, as individuals, as families, can serve those who need to be served, Lord God. The ones that you love, Lord God. We can't take any of this with us, and so we just pray that we'll pour it all out like Rose did. Pour it out, all out like, like In Ministries has, Lord God. And serve the kingdom. Build the kingdom. And love those who the world has forgotten about. Lord, we just pray for each and every person to feel uh, your presence today and your Holy Spirit uh, changing their heart to a heart that puts you first and puts your people ahead of ourselves. Lord, we pray that we become the servants that Jesus showed us so brilliantly how to become. Lord, we pray that our lives reflect the life of our Savior, and that as we approach Easter, Lord God, we see that you came, you lived, you died, and you were resurrected to save us from our sin so that we could go out and serve. Lord God, we love you. And we pray a blessing over the rest of today. You change our hearts. You let Good Soil Church make an eternal impact in the world around us and the world abroad. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.